So this presentation is being recorded. Um, so yeah, there'll be an opportunity to go back and view things again if you need to. Um, so without any further ado, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, um, which will be Matthew Baldock. Um, take it away, Matt. Think Matt is able to come on board. Okay, yeah, thank you, Jamie. Um, uh, I can't start my video for some reason, but uh, anyway, um, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for making time to uh, come to the uh, presentations today by the staff from uh, CASA. Um, as uh, Jamie said, uh, Jeremy is unab unable to make it today, so I'll be filling in for him today. Uh, I'm not able to be in the office today because I have a cold and I thought 2021 is not the year to be giving other people uh, my cold. So I'm at home today um, doing this uh, introduction. And anyway, my, uh, my role today is just to give you a brief introduction to CASA and update on, on what we're up to. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Centre for Automotive Safety Research. Uh, nonetheless, for those of you who aren't, I'll just give a, a quick, a very quick history. Uh, so we actually started off in 1973 as the Road Accident Research Unit at the University of Adelaide. And uh, this was under uh, Professor Jack McLean, who during the 1970s uh, led uh, a program of very detailed in-depth at scene crash investigation, which led to some uh, very uh, detailed reports late in the 1970s. Um, and this built on some earlier work Jack had done uh, with the Department of Pathology in the 1960s. So through the 1980s and 1990s, uh, the Road Accident Research Unit was funded by the National Health and Medical Research Council. And so did a lot of very medically focused work in that time, particularly. So lots of stuff on alcohol and its role in road crashes and uh, head injuries, for example. Then in the early 2000s, uh, we entered into a deed of agreement with the state government. And at, at which point uh, we changed our name to the Center for Automotive Safety Research. And uh, through this deed, we actually undertake an ongoing research program um, for the government um, looking at anything related to road safety. So across all of the road safety pillars. Um, so this uh, obviously provides us with a, a fair degree of uh, sustainable, uh, sustaining funds for our work, but we also uh, do other work outside of the deed. So um, we also do testing for the Australasian New Car Assessment Program. So this is in our laboratory at Kent Town where we do the pedestrian subsystem testing. So uh, this is looking at the likelihood that a pedestrian will be injured in the event of being struck by that particular car. And that feeds into the star rating for the vehicle. We also do a lot of uh, contract research for other groups. So uh, in the past uh, couple of years, we've done work for the Transport Accident Commission, the Australasian Centre for Rail Innovation, the Australian Automobile Association, uh, Defence, and the state governments in Victoria, Tasmania, Queensland, New South Wales, Western Australia, and the ACT. So the only one we've missed in the last couple of years is the Northern Territory. But um, uh, we also have done quite a bit of work for Osroads, which of course takes in all of the uh, state and territory governments in Australia, as well as New Zealand. And we also do work for local governments here um, in South Australia. So. Um, a, a lot of work for a lot of groups um, uh, on, on road safety, in addition to the uh, ANCAP testing and the work we do for our local state government. Now, of course, um, across Australia, lots of governments, uh, including the federal government, are putting together their new road safety strategy. So this is a very important time uh, for getting our research evidence uh, put into uh, policy and practice. And indeed, we have been quite active in helping a number of governments, uh, both the South Australian one, uh, the federal one, and uh, uh, governments elsewhere in, uh, in developing their strategies and, and providing uh, research evidence to guide um, on the plans for, for getting towards, uh, uh, ultimately towards zero um, in the, the middle of this century, hopefully. Um, so, you know, providing evidence for, for government um, in, in uh, developing roads uh, safety strategies is very important to CASA um, and, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a very core part of what we try to do. Um, now, I mentioned our deed program uh, earlier that we do every year for the state government. I'll just quickly mention some of the things we're doing this year. 
Um, indeed, in, consistent with the need for input into the strategy, we've been uh, doing uh, some modeling of countermeasures and uh, the, the likely effects on road trauma from implementation of various levels of those countermeasures um, in the future. Um, also, uh, specifically, we're also doing uh, modeling of in infrastructure investment. So obviously road infrastructure is very important for improving safety, but um, you know, it's very important to try and uh, get the best bang for your buck. Where do you invest the money that's gonna give you the best outcomes um, over the medium and long term in order to transform the road system to make it um, uh, uh, you know, eliminate harm in the future. Uh, also, uh, whenever you have a strategy, ideally you monitor and evaluate that strategy, which requires the development of uh, key performance indicators. So we're also doing work to try and uh, help develop some, some good uh, KPIs for the strategy. Um, so obviously you have counting of crashes and measurements of trauma, but ultimately we want to transform the road system. And so we want some KPIs that are, that are about how, how the system is, is transforming um, to get to the point where, where harm is eliminated. Um, also other work we're doing, of course, is our ongoing uh, in-depth crash investigation work looking at the uh, penetration of uh, vehicle technologies uh, into the vehicle fleet, particularly in rural areas where they're very important. Um, looking at the role of mental health in crashes and uh, mental health outcomes in the long term resulting from road crashes, um, which is probably an understudied area in road safety. Plus, we're, we're updating some uh, previous work we've done, including uh, medical conditions in road crashes and uh, extreme behaviours. So this was a, a very influential piece of work we did a few years back, looking at the role of um, extreme behaviour. So, you know, high level speeding, high level drink driving, risk taking in uh, serious road crashes versus failures in the road system where people weren't doing anything really, really risky, um, but still ended up either dying or being seriously injured. Um, and it's likely as the system gets safer that it, uh, more and more you will actually need extreme behaviors in order to have a, a fatal road crash. So we're gonna see how things are changing in that regard. Um, and again, that kind of information is really important for, for guiding your strategy, particularly looking at the differences between fatal crashes and serious injuries, which, which are quite different. Um, anyway, so it's a, I think a, a really good um, program we've got for, for this year. And um, I think today provides a, a really good snapshot of the, the breadth of the work we're doing um, at CASA and have been doing recently. Um, so, you know, one of our most famous studies was looking at uh, the relationship between traveling speed and the risk of a casualty crash and, um, you know, led by Craig Cloden. But recently, Sam Dakey has been um, doing uh, quite a few studies um, looking at the relationship between various measures of speed and various injury outcome measures um, using EDR data, which is um, you know, data downloaded from the vehicle itself. So a very accurate measurement of, of speed at the time of the crash. And I think this, um, this research should be as, as influential as the early work by Cloden. Um, also, as I mentioned, uh, of course, we do the testing for ANCAP at our laboratory. We also do a, a lot of other forms of testing, including you know, testing of mining vehicles for their safety, um, for underfloor protection, um, and today, Jamie McKenzie is going to be talking about um, some testing of uh, vehicle brakes that uh, they've recently done. Also, as well as doing research, it's very important to us at CASA that we um, transfer the knowledge that we develop through this research uh, and undertake training where possible of future road safety professionals. Um, and as part of this, uh, Christopher Stokes has led the development of a, a course in the safe system. And um, you know, I, I, what I've seen in this course, it looks excellent. And I think um, a lot of you will find this very interesting. So Chris will be talking about that. Uh, also, you know, as researchers, it's very important that we keep on top of you know, developing and emerging issues and, and, and what's the, the current state of play in, in road safety. And of course, um, a good example of a, a new issue we hadn't faced before was COVID. Uh, so uh, Martin Elsigood today will be providing some uh, preliminary analysis of uh, the effects of COVID on, on traffic in South Australia. And finally, uh, it's very important to always be monitoring uh, progress in road safety and, and looking at you know, road crashes that are occurring and, and where the gaps are in the system that we still need to plug. 
So last year, we actually looked at a number of different um, crash categories and crash types uh, to get a real um, detailed picture of those crashes and, and what's um, in being involved in them and, and where the gaps still are. Uh, and one of those we looked at was older pedestrians. So this really emerged out of an Osroad study we did where we noted that um, older pedestrians were making up an increasing uh, proportion of, of road trauma. So it was something really worth looking at closely. And so James Thompson will be presenting on, on work we did uh, looking closely at older pedestrian crashes in South Australia. So I think this, this talk today um, should uh, give a, a really good example of the breadth of work uh, that we do. And um, for us, it's a great opportunity to, to share our work with you. Um, because as I said, it's very important for us that um, our work becomes known and that it, that really feeds into uh, the policies and practices that are going to uh, improve road safety um, in South Australia, but also uh, more broadly. So um, that's just a quick sort of summary of CASA and, and uh, uh, what we've been up to. But, uh, you know, the main show today is the other researchers talking about um, their projects uh, in detail. So Without further ado, I'll, I'll pass back to uh, Jamie, who uh, will get the show on the road. So thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. Fantastic. Um, it's a really good overview of everything we do. I always feel like everybody here is really busy, and um, that's why <laughs> we're doing a lot of stuff. Um, so yeah, I will pass over now to uh, Sam Doki, who's going to talk to us about um, speed, speed curves and event data recorders. So please take it away, Sam, when you're ready. Hello everyone. So yes, uh, I've been at CASA. Many of you might know me. I've been around for about 14 years uh, by now, which is a bit scary. Um, and yeah, my, my main areas of expertise are um, vehicle technologies. Um, and lately I've been working a lot on speed. Um, I've also been um, involved in our at scene crash investigations here uh, since I started. So, yeah, just a little bit about event data recorders uh, first. Um, there's something that's in a car, but a little bit like a black box in a plane um, that record critical data in the, the event of a crash. Um, they're put in there by the manufacturers um, for their own purposes. And probably one of the most interesting things we can get off them is speed for up to five seconds before the crash. There's a range of other information we can get, including pedal inputs and delta Vs and things, which are all interesting as well. Um, but uh, speed is probably the biggest one. Now, unfortunately in Australia, we don't have a design rule that covers uh, these and says they have to be in there and that they have to be publicly accessible. Um, so what, essentially what we have is piggybacked off the fact that there's a regulation in the US. Um, fortunately, we do have access to Toyotas, but which are the, the biggest selling brand um, in Australia. Um, and Holden's, which of course we're one of the biggest selling brands and no longer a brand that's sold, but there's still a lot of them out there. Um, and there's some other brands as well. Um, and more recently, uh, they added Subarus and Mitsubishis. Now, this is just an example of uh, one of the important tables in an event data recorder file. Um, we have time before the crash up the top, uh, and then we have the vehicle speed um, and uh, this actually, you see that this person was traveling very fast. This actually happened to be on a 60 kilometer hour road in the metropolitan area, uh, fortunately very uh, late at night. Um, you can see a few other things that are going on there, but I'm not gonna uh, go through them um, in detail, uh, but we have uh, when he's on the brakes, how hard he's braking um, or she, uh, and uh, how they're steering. You can see that they steered very hard uh, towards the end there before the impact. So uh, just to summarize what we've been doing at CASA with event data recorders. Um, we initially um, bought the, the tools for this um, just as something uh, to add to it for our at scene in-depth crash investigations. Um, we conducted a few test downloads um, and then we downloaded from uh, every vehicle involved in one of those crashes we investigated uh, that we could access. Uh, but this uh, didn't yield high numbers, only 12 uh, over a three year period, but we really saw how valuable this information was. Um, and so we wanted to get more of it. So in 2017, um, 
we conducted a pilot study on targeted collection of EDR data. Um, and we wanted to see how feasible this was, um, uh, whether we could do it, what we could match it to. Um, and we discovered that you know, somewhere around 8% of the written off vehicles in South Australia all are channeled through um, one location. Um, and so by attending this location, um, we could download from a lot of vehicles. Um, we also um, uh, approached uh, SAPOL and particularly their major crash uh, unit to be able to get the, the EDR files um, that they were downloading uh, from vehicles involved in fatal or, or near fatal crashes. And so, yeah, this, this initial part study uh, yielded 91 EDR files, and we were able to then match uh, these to police reports in most cases. Because that was uh, really successful, um, we thought this would be a good thing to do on an ongoing basis, build up a, um, you know, a relatively large uh, sample of this data. Uh, so from 2018 onwards, uh, we started off doing uh, aiming for 100 per year, uh, funded by uh, our DIT here, uh, but we've been able to expand this to uh, 200 a year with additional funding from TAC from Victoria. And our current sample, um, we have about 730 of these. So just to give you one of the quick results uh, from this data, there's a lot in it. There's a lot that we can uh, get from it that we were still planning to get from it, but of course, one of the big things is speeding. Um, and so we can find from this that uh, a quarter of the striking vehicles in these crashes were speeding. So the vehicle that you know is, is going through, um, not the vehicle that's say turning out or something like that. And when we try and get this down to free speed vehicles, which is a little bit tricky, um, but we can make some, um, some criteria to try and identify free speed vehicles, this gets even higher right up to 38%. And free speed being just a vehicle that's not being impeded by um, other traffic is actually able to choose what speed they're going at. So yeah, that's uh, very high, I think, uh, level of speeding. Um, perhaps higher than we expected. The other large thing that we've been doing in the area of speed um, is to do with uh, risk curves. And you will probably be familiar with uh, these risk curves, which uh, come from uh, a publication by Ramberg back in 2005. Um, these versions I've taken from uh, the previous South Australian strategy, but they appear in a, a lot of kind of different forms um, in various strategies and, and documents um, around Australia and elsewhere. Um, the problem with these is um, when we go back and look at the original publication that they came from, uh, it's, there's no data on where or information where, what they're based on. Um, they simply just appear in this publication, which was more of a, uh, a policy publication. So we don't know if they were actually based on empirical data where they appeared from. Um, and so we wanted to do these with the best data we could, which um, as we'd found from our experience with EDR data was, was that kind of data. Now, unfortunately, we didn't have uh, a massive database of that data here uh, at that time, although our database is, is slowly increasing in size. Um, so we went to uh, a, a very large US database um, because they have a, a large program of collecting this type of data and they have access to um, almost all their vehicles are supported. So uh, we used a total of 1,425 EDR files. Um, we looked at just light vehicle versus light vehicle. Um, some other people have been doing um, good work in the area of pedestrian risk. Um, so that was the main gap. Uh, we looked at it from the vehicle level. Um, so the risk uh, for a given uh, vehicle and all its occupants um, in a certain type of impact. Uh, and we looked at average impact speed for head-on crashes and closing impact speed uh, for other impact types. And this is what we came up with. Now, the main change, if we compare this to um, the kind of previous, uh, uh, the Ramberg curves, is that um, head-on crashes and side impact uh, uh, 
impacts have switched uh, positions. So um, in this curves that we have produced, head-on crashes have carried the highest risk um, at a given speed. And if we look at this more in a, a kind of a table format at discrete levels of risk, um, you can see uh, that clearly. Now, also previously, there's been this concept of 10% risk is what we should be aiming for. Um, don't really know where that came from either. That seems way too high. Um, this table does give discrete risks, but I think really what we should be moving towards is looking at how many of these type of impacts are actually occurring out there on the network and then basing what is our acceptable level of risk um, on that. Now, the hard thing that people have struggled with when they, they see these results, um, I've noticed is because we've been taught for so long uh, that uh, side impacts are the worst um, and are worse than head-ons, um, it's hard to get your head around why head-ons are actually worse. So I'll just try and explain that briefly. I think there's two, um, two central reasons, two overriding reasons. Um, first is when we consider what's actually going on in a head-on crash. So in head-on crash, let's get, have an example where we have two vehicles uh, going at 100 kilometers an hour uh, towards each other. Uh, when they impact, uh, provided they're roughly the same mass, they will just come to a stop. They'll be going zero kilometers an hour. So this gives us a, a change in velocity or delta V of 100 kilometers an hour. And delta V is something that's been shown uh, many times to be related uh, to the uh, the severity um, and the injury outcomes. Now, in a, in a side impact crash, we have a vehicle again going 100. The other vehicle is has uh, no velocity in that direction. Um, it may have some velocity uh, going in a different direction, um, but we can largely ignore that in this example. After the impact, provided again that same mass and this impact happens around the center of gravity um, of uh, each vehicle, then they're going to be going 50 kilometers an hour. And so the delta V is 50, so it's half. Now, that being said, there is a higher risk at a given delta V in a side impact because we have less protection, um, less space to work with. Um, but this is, this is part of the reason why head-ons are more severe. Now, the other aspect of it is that when we think of a side impact, we tend to think of an impact like this, um, or perhaps it, on the other side, on the driver's side, which would be even worse. Now, this is centered right in the middle of the car um, where the occupant is, um, but even this crash, which is very severe and was very severe, this actually has a very high closing speed of 138 kilometers per hour. What we often see as well inside impacts, um, which we don't think of so much, are impacts that are away from the occupant compartment that are in front of either in front of the A pillar is probably more common, but could be uh, behind the C pillar as well. Um, and this crash, as you can see, it doesn't look hugely severe. There's not a massive amount of intrusion uh, into the occupant compartment there, but this, this did happen at 94 kilometers per hour. Uh, and in this case, um, the occupant that was the, uh, the left front seat occupant there was, was not seriously injured. I think we've also come a long way uh, with side impact protection. Um, so this was a side impact. This is in that kind of central uh, position on the occupant compartment. Um, but you know, this is a, a fairly modern vehicle. We have, uh, we have airbags protecting um, and uh, this actually occurred at 80 kilometers an hour, but again, uh, no serious injuries. When we contrast that to head-on crashes, a head-on crash, even if it is towards the side or as it is offset, in fact, it is severe. And in some cases that can even be more severe um, if it is uh, offset. So this is a fairly low offset um, head-on crash. Um, as you can see, it's done quite a lot of damage to the vehicle. There is very little space there where the driver's legs were, um, resulted in very serious uh, leg injuries uh, to the driver. But this occurred at an average impact speed of only 47 kilometers uh, an hour. 
So what is next? Uh, we want to do the same risk curves, but looking at travel speed rather than just uh, impact speed. And that is for it getting uh, very close to being done. Uh, we also want to look at how these different uh, speed variables relate to each other. So how travel speed relates to impact speed. So how much speed do you lose before impact? And then that, how that translates uh, to delta V, such as uh, in that example I gave, but using empirical data. Uh, and uh, this year as well, we are conducting a detailed analysis of speeds in the CASA EDR database that we've been building up. We're going to have a deep dive um, into all things uh, to do with speeds and speeding in that data. So thank you very much and um, happy to take questions. Sorry, I went a little bit long. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. Fantastic. Um, as Matt said um, earlier, I think this is really um, important for the future of road safety. Um, so we could, do have a couple of questions. Keep sending them in if you've got questions. Um, so John has asked, uh, how do you determine the causing vehicle from the non-causing vehicle? I assume in the EDR data I was talking about. Right. Um, so with, the, with our EDR database, uh, we match it to the police report. Um, so we have uh, essentially what, what happened um, in the crash and if we're thinking in terms of, of striking a um, vehicle we can also um, uh, see that from a combination of the police report um, and the, the damage uh, to the vehicle okay uh john also has another question so he's saying you you talked about 100 kilometer per hour speeds in crashes yet impact speeds are on average much lower than travel speeds he asks, how do you allow for that for example, EDR readings? Sure, so uh, in, in the EDR data, we can see both the travel and impact speed, provided um, that they haven't been braking uh, for a long time. So on in the odd occasion, someone will be braking for um, a longer period of time than the EDR data, so we can't see exactly what travel speed they were going, but in most cases, people are, are uh, braking for two seconds or less um, prior to the, the impact. Um, and we can see both those things. Was that answered all the question? Was there another component to it? Sorry, Jamie. I think that was it, yeah, yeah. Okay, but uh, yes, uh, the, they do wipe off a certain amount of speed. Um, those uh, risk curves were looking at impact speed. Uh, we wanna also look at, at travel speed and that will take account of, of some of that difference. Yeah, um, just a reminder that yeah, if anyone does have really in-depth questions, you obviously feel free to contact all the presenters. Um, so if you wanna get in touch and ask a bit more of a, a thorough question and answer session. Um, we've got another one here from Michael. Um, you've answered his question about curtain airbags, um, but he's also got another question for head-on crashes. Do you expect the latest ANCAP crash test using a mobile barrier and the encouragement of head-on crash avoidance to help? Um, I'm not sure is probably the short um, answer. Um, yeah, I was, I was discussing um, that with the, uh, yeah, with someone from our impact lab the other day. And I, I think, yeah, I'm unclear at this stage. I think what's good about it is um, previously with the just a static um, barrier, um, event, um, I suppose small, small vehicles got a bit of an advantage, um, in, in certain ways, um, because they're not, there's not, not as much energy in the impact, um, having a, a movable, uh, barrier, uh, of a certain mass, um, yeah, takes that away and makes it more realistic. And so, Hopefully that means increased um, frontal protection in smaller vehicles. Okay, uh, got another one from Adam. It says, this is going to change the thinking of crash severity based on crash type when undertaking road safety auditing. Um, I think that's it's a question. Is this going to um, change the thinking of crash severity based on crash type when undertaking road safety auditing? I'm not familiar with 
uh, road safety audits and exactly how they're conducted and done. That's not my particular area. Um, Chris uh, Stokes or, or Jeremy would know a lot more about that, but I, I imagine quite possibly yes. Um, I think um, one of my thoughts based on this is that really head-on crashes just they have to be prevented. Um, really, it's difficult to get down to a speed where they are, um, you would consider them really safe. The fortunate thing is that head-on crashes are actually not that common um, because everything has to align. Um, so an error has to be made and another car has to be there just at that moment. Um, of course, that makes them difficult to prevent because they kind of happen randomly across the network to a certain degree. Um, you know, unlike an intersection where it's a specific point, um, a head-on crash could occur over a stretch of the road. Um, and that's that's part of the challenge. But yes, I imagine it will, um, well, I hope it will, you know, be taken into account in these things. Okay, uh, so we'll do the last one. Uh, this is from Bron, who says he recalls the early work from CASA equating speed to alcohol in them. Um, so he's wondering, how does the recent data align with this early work? Uh, it's, it's looking at it in a different way. Um, so I suppose it, it is aligned in, in that um, it shows that speed is important um, and you know, risk of uh, injury increases uh, with speed. Um, but uh, that work was looking at, at relative um, risk um, from a, a base level, um, whereas this is looking at absolute risk, um, which is a bit, just a bit of a different um, way of doing it. So they're not exactly the same. And then the alcohol stuff was relative risk as well. So it could be directly uh, equated um, with that. Okay, well, thank you very much, Sam. Um, in the interest of fitting everyone in today, I think we'll move on to the next speaker. But, um, that has been really interesting, cheers. Um, the next speaker is me. So just bear with me while I figure out all my controls here, hosting and presenting at the same time. Um, okay, so, uh, what I wanted to talk about today um, is brake testing. Um, so uh, I will preface all this by saying that um, I am no expert on, on brake testing, um, but what I have done is uh, done a study with a few of my colleagues um, looking at brake testing. So uh, we explored, um, um, the ability of various brake testing methods to detect brake faults. Um, I'm not going to go into that today just because I don't have time to do it justice. Um, but that's given me a bit of experience. If you're interested in that in that study, you're, you're, it's freely available. You're more than welcome to go and look that up. So if you just search for uh, CASR 173, um, you'll, you should come across it. Be able to download it and have a look. Um, but while conducting that study um, as a person who, who isn't an expert on brakes, but as someone who drives a car and, and is working in road safety, I discovered a, a lot that I found to be really interesting um, and I thought that would be worth sharing. So today I'll be explaining how we conducted the study um, and discussing some of the topics that I found interesting. Okay, so First, we needed um, an accurate and repeatable way to emulate symptoms of, of various brake faults. Um, so we achieved this by having a set of brake line cutoff and proportioning valves professionally fitted to a test vehicle. You can see those in the pictures there. Um, so in effect, the brake line going to each wheel of a vehicle was then able to be manipulated um, using these, these valves. So for example, we could reduce the brake line pressure to the front right wheel by 20% or completely cut off the brakes at the rear left wheel. Um, we also had pressure sensors installed so that we could monitor and log the brake lines uh, and ensure repeatability during the testing. Um, so you can see a little bit of a diagram there, but hopefully you get the idea is that we can turn the, 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 the brake pressures 
at various wheels up and down um, to meet our needs. The next requirement was to be able to apply a repeatable brake press over all test conditions during the study. So for this, we used a brake pedal robot that was developed at CASA. Um, you can see that in the pictures there, um, the left and middle picture. Um, the robot was programmed to provide a spe specific constant force upon the brake pedal with a consistent rate of application. So the same brake press every time. Um, the robotic system was able to measure and log the brake pedal force um, to again ensure that we were doing that consistently across the study. Um, in the picture on the right, you can also see our um, high-tech triggering system. <laughs> The test driver presses a button on the controller there that's taped to the steering wheel and that activates the robot to apply the brakes. Um, throughout the study, we also monitored the vehicle's tyre pressures and brake pad temperatures to ensure that they remained within the nominal levels. Okay, so I want to show you four examples of brake testing methods. Um, the first one is the stopping distance test. Um, we did this at 80 kilometres an hour. So the vehicle is accelerated up to the test speed. Um, in our case, we use cruise control um, and the brakes are applied firmly until the vehicle comes to a stop. So you can see the driver setting the cruise control here. Um, you can see the, the robot between the driver's legs and when they press the button, that will apply. Coming up, there we go. You can see it's fairly violent test. Um, after doing that test, we can measure the distance between when braking was started and when the vehicle stopped. Um, from this, we can calculate um, an average deceleration across the, the braking sequence. The stopping distance test is generally accepted as a definitive assessment of a vehicle's brake system as it occurs under real world conditions. However, it does require an area where high speeds can be achieved safely, um, and it does require accurate direct position view. Um, it can also, um, it also provides an assessment of the vehicle's brakes as a whole. Um, so, you know, if you had a fault with just a single uh, wheel, a minor fault, um, you probably wouldn't be able to pick that up um, with this type of test. So just before I show the other sort of brake test methods, I wanna, I wanna pause to show some examples of the effect that different brake faults have on stopping distance. Um, so you might not see, be able to see all the details here, but I'll, I'll, I'll explain what, what you're looking at. Each row here shows the stopping distance recorded under various fault conditions during the stopping distance test that I just showed. So the top row here um, is the, the vehicle in normal condition. And this, um, in this case, the vehicle stopped um, with a distance, of, uh, in a distance of 27 meters. Below that, in the rest of the rows, um, the cutoff and proportioning valves were adjusted on the vehicle to emulate different fault scenarios. And the effect that it had on increased stopping distance is shown in red. Um, so I'll just go through the few, a few of these that I found interesting. So cutting the rear brakes to 50% um, extended, that is this one here, extended the stopping distance by only about 2.6 meters. Um, so you know, your rear brakes are only working at half capacity. Uh, okay, it extends your, your stopping distance, but only a little bit. Completely disabling the rear brakes, that's this one here, um, extended the stopping distance by 8.1 meters. Um, that's, you know, getting a bit scary, but um, I, I found that surprising that completely cutting the brakes off, um, you still come to a stop. Um, and this was not as bad as reducing the front brakes to 66%. So that is this one of capacity, which extended the stopping distance by 12.3 meters. Um, and just to show you uh, the next one, we reduced the front brakes to 54% capacity um, and that increased the stopping distance by almost 20 meters. Um, if you stop and have a think about this, um, you know, it, it does make sense. Your, your vehicle pitches forward when you're braking and a lot of your brake power comes from the front brakes. Um, but, you know, as a layman, you, you know, that's kind of surprising that you can completely cut your rear brakes and you'll still be stopping, you know, fairly quickly. Okay, so back to the different brake test methods. Um, the next one is the decelerometer. Um, sorry about the strange camera angle here, but. Show an example of how it works. 
excuse me. So this is a, a, a simple device that's intended to emulate the stopping distance test but at low speed such that it can be conducted on a local road. So the unit is placed um, in the footwell or passenger seat um, in the correct orientation and the vehicle is then accelerated to a speed of around 40 k's an hour and the brakes are applied firmly until the vehicle comes to a stop. Um, the device contains accelerometers to automatically detect the test and calculate the brake performance, which as you can see is then printed out in a little docket. Um, you can see an example of that printout on the right hand side there. Um, you can then sort of start a new test and, and, and go again, as you can see in the video here. Um, like the stopping distance test, the vehicle brakes are assessed as a whole. Um, so faults to individual wheels are unlikely to be identified during this method. Um, but it is sort of quick and easy and does give fairly accurate results. The next one is the roller brake tester. Um, so that looks like this. The vehicle is driven onto a, uh, the tester so that the wheels of one axle are resting on a pair of cylinders. These cylinders rotate the vehicle wheels and then the brakes are applied. So you can see that starting to rotate, brakes being applied. Um, the reaction force um, that's then applied to the cylinders as a result of this braking is measured um, and used to calculate the deceleration. Um, so you can see the, the rear axle being tested there, but you would then go on and test the front axle. Both axles are tested and the, the results are combined to provide an assessment of overall deceleration. Because the left and right wheels of each axle are tested independently, um, the roller brake tester is also able to determine whether there is any difference in the left and right brake force. So we can pick up um, small differences in the, you know, to, to individual wheels uh, using this test. So it's a little bit of an advantage there. Finally, we have the plate brake tester. Um, so let me start that video. Um, in this one, the vehicle is driven slowly across two pairs of plates secured to the floor. And as per usual, the plates are applied firmly. Um, these plates are fitted with sensors that measure the forces generated as the vehicle comes to a stop. Um, in this case, you can also, the, the handbrakes being tested there as an additional test. Um, Again, these forces are then used to calculate the vehicle's deceleration. Um, and again, this test measures uh, the forces at each of the individual four wheels. Um, so the, the tester, the yeah, um, plate brake tester is able to determine when there's a difference between left and right the, um, brakes of a single axle. So in the results, example results, you can see that on the right, um, the front right wheel in this case can be seen to have a quite a low brake force and that's been picked up and this um, vehicle has been given a fail. Okay, so, you know, we can use all these different methods to assess brakes, um, but, you know, what do we do with that data once we've got it? With regards to regulations um, on minimum performance criteria for brakes, each Australian state has their own criteria. Um, you can see those here. Uh, for all jurisdictions, the vehicle peak deceleration, so the, the maximum deceleration achieved over the, 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 the braking application, must reach 60% G, um, and the average deceleration varies by jurisdiction, but 39%, most of them a little bit higher in New South Wales, um, and up to 50% in New Zealand. Um, many jurisdictions, although not in South Australia, um, also mandate a maximum allowable imbalance between the left and right brake force. So again, this is where you're sort of saying one of your wheels is on one axle is braking harder than the other on either the left or the right. Um, so these jurisdictions say that, you know, this imbalance can't be greater than uh, 30%. As you can see, all these criteria are, are quite similar for the different jurisdictions. Um, I have not been able to determine how they were originally um, selected or defined. So if there is anyone out there in the audience that does know, um, I'd love it if you could you know, get in touch and let me know how these were originally defined. Um, because with my last slide, I just want to give an example of applying these criteria, um, basically as a discussion point. So here we have um, the case where we turned the front brakes down to you know, 54% of their maximum brake force. 
Um, this might be, you know, something that would occur if you had a, a master cylinder bypass that was a little bit faulty. Um, this fault resulted in an increased stopping distance of, of 20 meters. So, you know, almost 74% increase in, in the stopping distance that you would expect for that vehicle if it didn't have this fault. However, after testing the vehicle on all the different methods, um, they all gave results that passed all the criteria. In this case, we're using the New South Wales criteria, um, which is, as I've said, a little bit more stringent than South Australia. Um, but all the results passed, and this vehicle is completely legal to be driving on the road. Um, some of them only very closely just passed, but nonetheless, it was a pass for the criteria. Um, as I've said, I, I don't have a good understanding of how these regulation criteria were developed, um, but I think you will agree that um, it does bring into question the appropriateness of the criteria for modern vehicles. Uh, it is a little bit alarming that a vehicle with a, an increased stopping distance of 20 metres um, is deemed as, as, as working satisfactorily. So I'll just leave you with that um, and happy to take any questions. So again, just bear with me momentarily while I sort out my Q&A session. Um, okay, so we've got one question come in, so please send in more if you've got them. Um, John has asked, the evidence is that drivers manage brake performance issues very well, e.g. truck drivers when driving a truck versus when they're driving a car. How do, we, do you adjust for this? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, we, we, we didn't look at trucks during this um, study. It's very much um, confined to light vehicles. I uh, know trucks are a whole, whole different issue. Um, but yes, you know, if, if, you, if, if you have a car and you're driving it and you're, you know your brakes are a bit worrisome, you obviously compensate by braking a little bit earlier. Um, but the concern for me comes when, um, you're in an emergency situation. Um, so knowing that you have to brake a little bit earlier when you're coming to a stop at a traffic light or a queue of traffic is okay, but if there's an emergency situation and something steps out in front of you, you need to have your brakes working um, as well as they possibly can um, to you know, either prevent that crash or wipe off as much, as much speed as possible. Um, so John said that original ADR is related to very old vehicles and tyres. Yes, I, I suspected that was the case. Um, I suspected that these regulations were um, defined back um, when, you know, 60% G was an acceptable rate. Um, but modern, modern vehicles can achieve much more than that. Um, and I think holding ourselves to that kind of um, criteria, um, we should try and aspire to do better. Uh, Ron is asking, he agrees, it's surprising that the latest example passed Australian requirements. What about New Zealand requirements? So yeah, New Zealand requirements were very similar. Um, I couldn't find a maximum peak deceleration required for New Zealand. Um, I'm not sure if we had one or they just used the, the average deceleration. So if we go and look that up, 50% G. Um, both those tests would have passed the New Zealand requirement as well. So even, even there. Um, Rob has asked, what's your relationship to Standards Australia? I, I, don't, I don't have any relationship to Standards Australia. Um, so this is all independent research. Um, Unless there's any other questions, last questions coming in, we might move on. So if you do desperately want to ask a question, um, get it in quickly. Otherwise, as I say, just put Jamie before it if you think of something later, and I can I can address that later. Um, okay, fantastic. Thank you for your. Um, for your time and I will move on to the next speaker. So let me stop my share.
Um, and the next person we've got is Chris. So if you want to start yours up, Chris. And yeah, thank you, Jamie. Okay, fire away. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I'll just try sharing my screen. So give me a minute, please, everyone. There we go. So that should be working now. Uh, so thank you, Jamie, and thank you for everyone who's come along to listen to our talks. So I'm Chris Stokes uh, from CASA. Um, so I'm on the infrastructure engineers at CASA, and while my main role is around research into road safety infrastructure, I do also do a fair bit of teaching. Um, one of my main roles in teaching over the um, numerous past years has been to teach the traffic engineering and design undergraduate course for civil engineers. More recently, we started delving into short courses. And so what I want to present today is on the first course, short course that we've developed and are now delivering. So it's Safe System for Road Engineers and Managers. So we're all pretty familiar with the SAFE system. It has been around in Australia and New Zealand since the early 2000s. Um, and the SAFE system is really regarded as leading practice in road safety these days. It's underpinned by that idea of shared responsibility. And so that's shared responsibility between road users and the managers who manage the road system. Um, and we come to the idea these days that we really need to lead that shared responsibility as road managers and professionals. The main objective really of the SAFE system is to set a pathway for the elimination of road trauma. Um, historically, we've looked at reducing the likelihood of crashes and while that is still very important, um, the main focus now is really on reducing that road trauma because we understand that we're never going to get rid of all crashes. So we're really just trying now to get rid of serious injury and fatal crashes and try and reduce as best that we can the other types of crashes. So we've had that theory down pat pretty well for the last couple of decades. But more recently, we've come to the question, OK, how do we actually achieve this practically? So if we look back to 2018, um, Jeremy Woolley here from CASA, who's our director, um, was involved in the inquiry into national road safety strategy. And there are a couple of highlights out of this that I want to point to you. And the first one is that there was really a lack of practical implementation in terms of the safe system. So we've been really good at putting into our policies and the like actually looking at what that means in terms of practice on the road, we haven't been so good at. And one of the reasons for this is that we really have a bit of a lack of cohesion in terms of understanding of how to achieve practical implementation of the safe system. And part of this has come from a real need um, to upskill road professionals in terms of that practical side of the safe system. So that's really been the main driver for developing this course. And it's called Safe System for Road Engineers and Managers. And what it really is, is a short online course that can be undertaken at your own pace. So we've really aimed it towards professionals who are working during the day and really don't have that time to go back to uni, but may want to improve their knowledge of the safe system. So we've aim this course at improving understanding of the safe system, but also really building practical knowledge of safety infrastructure and especially how that aligns to the safe system. Uh, the course is gonna be great for young engineers who are just getting into the profession and really want to set themselves above their peers, but it's also gonna be good for more seasoned professionals who are really just looking to improve their knowledge a bit and who wanna go back and upskill a bit. So there are a couple of key learnings of the course I want to highlight. And the first one is that we do go through those basics of the safe system. And we really go back to the core principles of the safe system and a bit of the theory around it. Um, but then pretty quickly, we jump into the, um, into the main mix of it, which is looking at road safety infrastructure and those key road crash types. And so we're really looking at what are the me uh, mechanisms for those key road crash types. How do we mitigate 
the harm that can come from those and really how does infrastructure help us? And so one of the main learnings that we're looking at out of this course is to be able to identify what infrastructure really aligns well with that um, objective of minimising fatal and serious injuries and what doesn't work so well. Also in the course, we go through some of the tools that are available to practitioners. So those that are available to assess practically what they're doing and look at the alignment with the safe system. But we also look a bit into the future and how we can systematically improve the road network over time to gain that, um, to, to be able to get us closer to the elimination of fatal and serious injuries. So we aim this course to be as practical and interactive as we can. Um, firstly, we incorporate a lot of the learning material that we developed with the Transport Accident Commission of Victoria uh, back in 2018. That material was aimed towards undergraduate courses, so it was really bringing safe systems into um, engineering courses. But we've been able to synthesise that into this short course. And so we um, use that material to really drive home a lot of that practical implementation um, theory and how we get it out there in practice. We also try to make the courses engaging as possible. And so we do a lot of that through interactive case studies. So it really gives you the ability to go there and test your theory on a practical issue. And of course, any course needs some sort of assessment. And so the other way that you can test your theory is through the assessment quizzes at the end of each section of the course. As I said before, this isn't really meant to be a university course where you come in and you're put under strict assessment um, styles, like such as an exam. This is really to be done under your own pace. So under your own time, it gives you that freedom to really explore things and explore the knowledge that you're building. So this is just a quick introduction to the course. Um, as I've said, it's really something that can be done at your own pace. It takes approximately seven to eight hours to complete. At the end of it, you can obtain a University of Adelaide Certificate of Completion. Um, the other benefit of the course is that it also unlocks regular interactive alumni sessions. So this is really an online environment where people who've completed the course, who are completing the course, can come together and discuss all issues, road safety, and myself and the director of CASA, Jeremy Woolley, and um, possibly others from CASA will also be involved in those sessions. So you're welcome to ask us questions there as well. So as I said, this is just a quick overview of the course. Um, if you want to learn any more about it, please do visit the Adelaide Uni PACE or P-A-C-E website. Um, so this course is filed under the industry specific courses. Or if you want, just feel free to contact me, please. Um, I will be on leave in a couple of weeks time, but um, we will get someone to get back to you during that time as well. So thank you everyone. And Jamie, I'll let you field any questions. Alrighty. Fantastic, thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, we have a couple of questions come in. Um, so John uh, has a question. So he says, safe system re refers to safe speed without any consideration of clearance distance. Uh, why is that? So, for example, at 50 kilometres an hour uh, with a one metre clearance distance, front vehicle uh, braking results in a crash 100% of the time. But at 110 kilometres an hour and a clearance of 200 metres, emergency braking vehicle in front um, is unlikely to result in a crash. Jamie, I'm not sure I'd be able to answer that question straight off. So I'll have to either field that to you. You might have a bit more of an idea or answer that later. Okay, yep, that's fair enough. I think that's probably a bit of a complex one. So yeah, John, feel free to, to pass that on um, in an email and we can, we can get back to you. Uh, Rob has a question. Um, do traffic lights decrease the crash rate but increase fatalities? Um, I, from what I've read in the literature and everything I know, you know, traffic lights don't actually increase the crash weight. And this is if we're talking about um, the same volume, so like for like volume at a signalised versus unsignalised intersection. 
Um, but what we really see is that traffic lights are installed where we have warrants to install them, which are around high volumes and higher speeds. Um, and so they're really the intersections where we're likely to get more crashes. And so that's why we see a lot of our crashes occurring at signalised intersections. It's really just down to exposure. Um, so no, while they don't um, increase the rate of crashes, I'd say they actually decrease the rate of crashes, we do see a lot of high severity crashes there because really a set of traffic lights does nothing to slow people down as they're going through the intersection. So if they do tend to run the light, well, we tend to get high speed crashes. Fair enough. So, okay, Adam has a question. Oh, the good questions. Uh, when is the course going to be released and how much does it cost, etc.? The course is released now. Um, it's pretty low key at the moment, but we'll be going out to industry um, people as well and seeing if they're interested in it. But yeah, feel free to go onto that PACE website. It's available now. Um, the cost we've set it at $495. Um, though we are really just open to discussion with people, especially around group bookings and giving discounts around group bookings. Okay, um, just waiting to see if any other questions come in. So if you do have any last minute questions, please send them in. All right, nothing coming through, but as, as I've said, do you have a question for Chris? Um, just chuck it in um, and we can get him to answer that later. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, we'll move on to the next person, um, which is going to be Martin. So when you're ready, Martin, fire up presentation and take it away. Thanks, Jamie. Um, hi, I'm Martin and I'll be uh, presenting on the effects of COVID-19 on traffic counts, speeds and crashes in 2020. Uh, Craig and Jamie have also contributed to this project. And a uh, quick disclaimer that this project has not been finalised yet and the results are preliminary. Uh, for traffic counts, add in site SCATS counters were used, which are the induction loops um, installed at traffic control intersections. Uh, the SCATs only count vehicles that travel through an intersection and they have no way of measuring vehicle speeds. But for the traffic speeds, we used um, add in sight Bluetooth sensors and they essentially detect when Bluetooth devices such as uh, cars, car stereos, um, when they pass by and then they match Bluetooth signals between multiple known locations and the speeds of the vehicles can then be calculated. So the Bluetooth sensors don't actually recognize all the vehicles, only ones with strong enough signals. Uh, the Add Insight system is also used to provide information on live traffic, like with the travel time prediction signs. Uh, for the crashes, uh, we use the TARS database. Uh, this is a collection of police reported crashes that have occurred in South Australia. We only reported on injury crashes as this was the most consistent threshold to compare different years by. Uh, the metro and rural zones are shown, uh, metro in yellow, and uh, the boundary line was taken from the ABS. And here are two timelines for 2020. On top, the new COVID cases per day in South Australia and on the bottom, the number of laboratory tests in SA. And there were two major COVID-19 periods. The first period highlighted was uh, the initial push to work from home where possible and stay home as much as possible. Um, the second one was the three-day lockdown in mid-November. Uh, looking at traffic counts, the locations uh, of the counters are shown and the counters, uh, they were very metro heavy. So there were about 9,000 counters in the metro areas and 275 in the rural areas. Uh, this graph here shows the raw traffic counts across all counters for 2018 and 2019. And there's an obvious uh, weekly pattern. 
Uh, the counts are higher on the weekdays and lower on the weekends. And now we can see the traffic count for all of South Australia in 2020 in red. Uh, there's a weekly pattern again, but uh, there's a significant reduction uh, from mid-March to mid-July. Also a large reduction in mid-November. Uh, over the whole of 2020 though, there was a reduction in traffic of 8.5% compared to the average of 2018 and 19. We used a seven day average to smooth the graph out and uh, reduce the modulation that was caused by the weekends. Uh, the large reductions are still present. And uh, unfortunately though, the seven day average method does not account for uh, the natural dips that are caused by public holidays. Uh, we've almost fi finalized another method to, isol to isolate the effects of COVID. Uh, however, the seven day average still gives a general picture of what's going on. Uh, this graph shows the traffic count percentage 2020 of 2018 and 19. Uh, for example, at the first major low point in mid April there, uh, the 2020 count on this day was 53% of the average of the same day in 2018 and 19. And the green dash shows, the green dash line shows um, 100%. Uh, splitting the graph into metro and rural, the, the rural counts appear to uh, return to normal quite faster than metro counts after the first COVID period. Um, but overall, there was an 8.6% metro reduction and 2.8% rural reduction in 2020. Moving on to traffic speeds, links were selected based on their length, usually between two and four kilometres, and uh, whether they had uh, the recording for the whole of 2019 and 2020. Uh, the data retrieval of the links took very long time to obtain and there's not too many of them. There's about 88 uh, metro links and only 10 rural links that we analysed. Uh, this is the raw data for the daily traffic speeds of 2019 and 2020. And just quickly note that the speed axis is zoomed in to show the finer details. Um, for traffic speeds, there is also a weekly pattern. Weekend average speeds tend to be three to 10% higher than corresponding weekdays. Uh, the average speed for 2020 though, was 0.7% lower than 2019 for all of SA. Using the seven day average filter again, the average speeds for 2019 and 2020 are shown there. Uh, 2020 is in red and you can see there's a small lift in traffic speed in mid-March and also a lift in mid-November when the three-day lockdown occurred. However, the, the lifts in traffic speeds in the COVID periods were not much, or that they were less than what the increase was in the Christmas period for both 2019 and 2020. And public holidays actually have quite a large effect. Um, this is our preliminary analysis and we've almost finished another one to mitigate the effects of public holidays and weekdays. Uh, here is the percentage 2020 of 2019 for traffic speeds in all of SA. Uh, Mid-March and mid-November have the small increases in average speed. And splitting that graph into metro and rural, we can see that the rural areas in purple um, seem to drop more due to the COVID periods, and then they tended to stay low after March. Uh, the metro areas seem to be relatively level, except for really close to the two COVID periods. Uh, now onto injury crashes. This is the raw data of daily crashes from 2018 to 2019 and 2020. And smoothing it out, the seven day average for injury crashes is there. 
uh, in 2020, there was an 18.8% per reduction in the total number of injury crashes compared to the average of 2018 and 19. Uh, looking at the percentage 2020 of 2018 and 19, the general trend was that crashes were lower in 2020 and splitting previous graph into metro crashes and rural crashes, we can see that there are reductions in both metro and rural and metro had a slightly larger reduction. And here are the summarized results from the graphs and the report to come will look more in depth into the specific COVID periods. So look forward to that. I'll leave this here while I hand back to Jamie. Fantastic, okay, thanks Martin. Yeah, it's obviously uh, COVID's given us an opportunity to have a, a real live social experiment for what happens when um, traffic goes down. Um, you've given us a whole bunch of results. I think you might have stunned people because we don't have any questions so far. <laughs> um, so we'll wait a, 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 maybe a minute or so to see if anyone's going to send anything in. Um, is there anything else you want to mention while we wait? Anything that surprised you? Yeah, I think the injury crashes went down quite a lot for not as much uh, percent, percent reduction for the counts. And I was quite surprised that the speeds didn't actually increase a lot when the counts were reduced significantly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, um, Julio asks, can you tell whether the average speed increases were due to less traffic or more extreme speeds? Yeah, we don't have data for the exact um, extreme speeds stuff, but in general, during the COVID uh, periods when traffic counts did go down, there was uh, an increase in the average speed, but it was, it was probably all less than about 5% increase for those periods um, when there was like a big reduction of say 30% drop in the number of counts. Okay. Um, there was a quite a big difference between the metro and rural results. This is my own question, by the way. Um, <laughs> do, you, do you have any sort of feelings about what why the, the metro and rural were so different? Mm, um, metro seems to be uh, a lot more, I don't know, people are more consistent with their behaviours and uh, because of the travel restrictions, rural, the general um, people that travelled in rural areas might have changed or the border restrictions could have changed different things throughout the years. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, heavy heavy fleet traffic may have changed their strategy for um, bringing things across the state. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so Matt asks, oh, it was interesting to see the average speed decreases in regional areas. Is there a possibility that this could be due to a higher percentage of heavy vehicles on the road that would be limited to? 100 kilometres per hour in 110 k zones. So I think he's suggesting what you've, what you're suggesting. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, just get that up. So that one there, you can see the big reduction in uh, traffic speeds for rural. So it could be the increase of heavy vehicle fleets. Yeah. Mm, so perhaps a, a backlog or, yeah, okay. Um, all right, we'll maybe wait a few more seconds in case there's any other questions. Otherwise, we can move on. Nothing coming through. Okay, well, thank you very much, Martin. Um, and we will move on to our final speaker, um, James Thompson.
All right. Um, everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Good. Great. Uh, so I'm going to speak about older pedestrians um, and the crash that they're involved in in South Australia. Um, I am the last talker, so I will endeavour to keep it short, sharp and shiny. So you can all get on with the afternoons after this. Uh, the Deputy Director of uh, CASA, Matthew Baldock, who um, introduced this webinar, uh, worked on this research with me. So I just wanted to thank him for that. Uh, so firstly, just to provide you with some background into why we thought that research into older pedestrians would be important or um, interesting. Uh, so firstly, uh, walking has been a, is a beneficial activity for personal health and well-being, obviously. Uh, and it's particularly beneficial um, for older adults. So um, because they're living longer than past generations and they're participating in more activities outside of the home. So it's, it's a wonderful thing that they, they increase in their walking and um, a, a large proportion of the population of older adults are walking and staying healthy and keeping active. However, it is a way of getting around that presents an increased risk for older adults. So previous studies have shown that older pedestrians have higher rates of deaths uh, compared to uh, younger pedestrians. And also um, older adults uh, have higher rates of deaths compared as pedestrians compared to all other modes of transportation. So um, for example, cars, buses, bicycles, that sort of thing. And this um, uh, vulnerability is basically due to fragility. So they are more likely uh, to be than younger people to be severely or fatally injured if they fall down or they're struck um, by a car. And um, they, they all may, may also have an increased risk of being involved in uh, pedestrian crashes in the first place. And that's due to declines in their health or cognitive and functional abilities. So a reasonable level of physical ability is crucial to negotiate the road in, uh, environment as a pedestrian. And deteriorating health or cognitive and functional abilities with age can make it substantially more difficult. Uh, particularly when crossing the road without traffic signals and judging the speed and distance of an approaching vehicle. So basically, uh, overall, what this suggests is that older pedestrians are both a growing road user group and also a vulnerable one. So the aim of the present research was to conduct a thorough investigation into crashes involving older pedestrians. Uh, and more specifically, the overall extent of uh, pedestrian versus motor vehicle crashes in South Australia was examined. And then we also looked at the characteristics of these collisions and the injury outcomes for the pedestrians involved. Uh, so in order to do that, we uh, obtained data from two sources and then analyzed it. So firstly, we looked at uh, police reported data um, from the traffic accident reporting system. Uh, for pedestrian crashes between 2008 and 2017. And we also looked at data from the Royal Adelaide Hospital for uh, pedestrians who were admitted as a result of a crash of a motor vehicle. And that was for two time periods uh, between January 2008 to November uh, 2010 and January 2014 to August 2017. And so admissions for this study were defined as serious uh, injury. So just to um, talk about the results now, what we found, uh, firstly, in terms of the results from the police reported uh, data, um, the graph that you see here is, uh, shows you the total number of pedestrians hit by motor vehicles in South Australia each year from 2008 to 2017 for three age groups separately. So we have a younger, um, well, a younger and middle aged group, which is the zero to 64 age group. And we also have uh, two older age groups. So we have a 65 to 74 group and a 75 and older group. Uh, so basically what you can see in terms of total crashes is that um, the younger and middle aged uh, pedestrians had far more crashes than the older age groups. 
Uh, and overall, over the 10 year period, you can see that the numbers have been decreasing for the zero to 64 group, but have been fairly steady for the older groups. Uh, the next graph shows the rates of pedestrians hit by motor vehicles per 100,000 uh, population. And so what this does is um, controls for differences between the groups in terms of uh, the population in each group. Uh, so you can see that over the 10 years, the rates declined uh, for all three age groups. But this time, what you can see is that the older age groups are much higher than the younger age groups. So what this shows is that they actually have a higher rate of crash involvement when you look at it um, standardized by population. Uh, the next graph shows the proportion of the pedestrians who were seriously or fatally injured. Uh, so of those pedestrians who were hit by a motor vehicle, what proportion were seriously or fatally injured is basically what this is showing. Uh, the two older groups were combined into a 65 and over group this time around uh, because the numbers for the groups separately were low for individual years. Uh, as you can see from the graph um, with the two groups this time, there's considerable variation amongst the years. Uh, but overall, older pedestrians had a higher likelihood of being seriously or fatally injured in eight out of the 10 years that we looked at. And uh, despite the variance, uh, the trend over the 10 year period was steady for older pedestrians, uh, but showed some decline uh, in the likelihood of serious or fatal injury for younger pedestrians, uh, particularly between 2013 and 2017, which is uh, towards the end of the blue line there. Some of the other findings that we got from the police reported data is firstly that a consumption of alcohol prior to a crash was low for older pedestrians. Um, but a third of pedestrians aged zero to 64 for whom BAC was known uh, had alcohol in their system. Older pedestrians are also less commonly responsible for their crashes uh, than younger pedestrians and less commonly caused the crash due to alcohol and not paying attention. Uh, older pedestrians are more commonly walking on the footpath when they were hit while younger pedestrians are more commonly walking on the road. And uh, almost all of um, the pedestrians, so across the entire sample of all age groups were crossing, uh, almost half of them, sorry, were crossing uh, without the aid of a pedestrian projected uh, crossing when they were hit. Uh, so, and the most common error for the, but made by this group of uh, pedestrians was inattention. So this is a big issue in terms of pedestrians in general. So basically, uh, this is people that are crossing the road without um, traffic signals or pedestrian protected crossings, so your zebra crossings, things like that. Uh, and it's basically your traditional jaywalking group. Um, and so it shows that half of our sample were doing that. Some other findings were just that uh, crashes involving, involving older pedestrians were overrepresented over on Fridays and during the day, so 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And crashes involving younger pedestrians were overrepresented on Sundays and between the hours of 6 p.m. and 6 a.m., so during the night. And finally, 89%, uh, so a majority of all pedestrian crashes occurred in 50 and 60 kilometer per hour speed limits. So that would just be a product of the most common speed limits found in metropolitan areas. And now just uh, to give you the results of the analysis of the admission data from the REH. Uh, and with this, we found many of the same results that we found with the police reported data. So older pedestrians were less likely than younger pedestrians to have alcohol in the system uh, when they were hit by a motor vehicle and seriously injured. They were also less likely to be found at fault for their crashes and their crashes, crashes were less likely to occur at night. A majority of serious pedestrian crashes of all ages in metropolitan areas and the areas uh, occur in metropolitan areas, I'm sorry, and in areas with a speed limit of 50 and 60 kilometers per hour. So very similar to uh, the police reported data. But the interesting uh, thing about the RAH data is that it provides uh, very detailed information on injuries, uh, which is not what you get with the police reported data. And so what we found with these uh, data is that we looked at injury severity scale 
and we found um, that seriously injured pedestrians did not differ from seriously injured younger pedestrians in the severity of the injuries, but were more likely to spend longer than 10 days in hospital, which suggests that they took longer to recover from the injuries. And patterns of injury by body region were similar between the both groups um, with injuries to external regions, the extremities and the head and neck being most common. So just to wrap this all up and provide you with some brief conclusions that I took from the study. Um, firstly, older pedestrians do have an increased crash risk in the first place. So uh, when you looked at that graph in terms of per population, it shows they have an elevated risk uh, above younger pedestrians. They're also vulnerable. So they're more likely to be seriously or fatally injured. Uh, and they take longer to recover from serious injuries. However, a positive is that they are less risk-taking risk as a group of pedestrians. So there's less alcohol involved in their crashes, less inattention. They're less likely to be responsible uh, for their crashes. They're less, less likely to be on the road when they're hit and they're less likely to be hit at night. So that's the end of the, my presentation. Um, thank you for listening and happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, James. Really informative stuff on an uh, important topic. A um, couple of questions come in. Uh, Rob has asked, how do you measure cognitive and motor skills in the elderly? Is, I mean, okay, is that um, something that you, you did during the, the study? Yeah, it's, it's not something we did in this study. Um, it has been done extensively with um, uh, older drivers and um, older people in general, but um, there's a range of different um, uh, tools to measure cognitive ability. Um, I don't have a list off of my head, but um, so they vary greatly in, in um, how uh, how useful they are and how um, valid and reliable they are. So yeah, there's lots of research on that. You have to, have to look that up and see which ones work best. But. Um, John said, so you've used a, a zero to 64 year group, which obviously includes young children. Um, did you consider using something else, say, you know, a 25 to 64 year group to exclude maybe that confounding factor of younger children? Yeah, it's an interesting, th it's, it's an interesting point. And in it's, it's, um, yeah, it's a very good, good idea, I think, to do, but, um, we just wanted a complete comparison group to the um, older pedestrians and um, something that would give us that the comparison to their vulnerability, so their fragility. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, maybe it would, that you've got a point, it would be good to just eliminate the children um, from the sample. Um, Ron has asked, are there any differences between the aged groups within the metro area? For example, CBD versus general urban suburbs. Uh, not that I know. We didn't specifically look at that. We included um, all sort of metropolitan and urban areas. Um, uh, we, we looked at yeah, just rural versus uh, metropolitan, and we um, we didn't look sort of divide it further up into urban and um, inner city. But that's a very good point. And perhaps further research should should look at that. Yeah. Um, just a question for myself. Uh, did you see any kind of trends in the sort of circumstances of collisions with elderly pedestrians? Yeah, um, I mean, it was hard because the, the sample was very large. We had, um, I think, three and a half thousand um, over the 10 years for the um, police reported data. So it was a big um, sample for that data. And for the REH admissions data, it was about three and a half hundred um, uh, cases. So uh, it was quite large. And so I couldn't really go into depth into the, um, the narratives of the crashes too much. Um, but just anecdotally, um, yeah, some interesting things showed up. Uh, in particular, looking at when we found that they were more likely to be hit um, on the, the, the footpath, that being older pedestrians, while young pedestrians were more likely to be hit when they were on the road. Um, yeah, it sort of suggested that um, younger pedestrians are more commonly just sort of crossing the road as, as you'd expect when they get hit by a car. But um, 
Older pedestrians were often doing very strange things. Uh, I've I just anecdotally found a lot of cases where they were, um, you know, someone would be reversing the car and they'd be standing behind trying to direct the car when they were hit or they were often hit in car parks. Um, so a lot of strange things like that. Um, so they weren't risk taking in terms of crossing the road, but um, they were just hit while they're doing lots of different things. Um, yeah, just, just something I noticed. Yep. So yeah, maybe the trend is there is no trend. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, John's just followed up on the um, the age range issue and said that he's had a um, there's a strong trend for reduced children pedestrian crashes, um, given that children are more and more being driven to school. Um, mm. And his his point that maybe there's a a confounding factor there that's reducing um, that other age group. Um, but yeah, okay, that's yeah. That's, yeah. Um, any other questions? Last call for questions. Um, if there isn't, and it, we do have one other question that's coming for Sam, if he is around. Um, yes. Welcome back. Um, so Rob has asked, can you capture whether a vehicle has autonomous braking and lane maintenance? I'm assuming he's talking from EDR data. Um, most of them, not yet. Um, yeah, I don't think we've seen anywhere that records um, whether it has that and what that's doing. Um, really do want to get that data. I think the thing is there that the, the main thing that has driven this is the US regulation, um, which I don't remember the date off the top of my head, but I think it was somewhere around 2012. And so a lot of these new systems um, were, um, were kind of just coming in um, or not, not here yet. And so that doesn't include, um, is this re uh, well, it's not exactly reg regulation, but it's similar. It, it says um, essentially, if you're recording this, then it has to be in this format and you should show these things. Um, and so, yeah, unfortunately it just doesn't always have them, but it does have, some have ESC um, and ABS and, and whether that's um, being triggered, um, but hopefully in the future, um, it will include those things. And certainly if we go down the path of, of having a regulation for it in Australia, um, which I believe we should, um, Europe's bringing one in um, fairly soon, then we should think about including um, having those things in because I think it's really important to be able to see what those active systems um are doing as well as what the drive themselves is doing uh, yeah completely agree um all right um we haven't had anything else come in so thank you very much james i think we'll just finish up there and we can have an early minute so let me bring up the slides Turn my cell phone so you can see me. Um, yeah, so I would just like to thank everyone for coming along. Um, please do feel free to contact the presenters. So all the email addresses are there. Um, but obviously, the CASA website has a whole bunch of information as well. Um, so do get in touch if you have more questions. Um, if there are any unanswered questions, I think we do get to them all. So we can, but if there are any ones that come in, um, we'll. I'll pass those on. Other than that, um, keep an eye out for the next session. Uh, AGM, as I mentioned, um, drive safe. Enjoy the rest of Friday um, and have a good weekend. See you later.